Well, good morning and welcome. It's great to have you with us again this morning as we share together our last message in this little series called Surprise the World, based on Michael Frost's book by the same name. As we gather today, we want to start by just recapping what we've looked at over the last three or four weeks, just to lay the context and give us the framework that we need for where we're going to go today. Back at the beginning in week one, we started by looking at that dual aspect of evangelism that's laid out for us in scripture. The understanding that there are some who are called to be evangelists. They're gifted, they're clearly called to be bold and clear in the way they present the gospel and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and invite people into relationship with him. The rest of us, though, are called to live questionable and intriguing lives that will cause other people to ask us why we do what we do. We're called to live these lives that are intriguing and and in doing so to be attentive to the opportunities that we get to simply share with people about who Jesus is. In 1 Peter 3 verses 15 and 16, remember it says to us, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope you have, but to do this with gentleness and respect. We're called to do that by living lives of radical blessing to other people. We then looked at how we can use our questionable and intriguing lives around our table, using hospitality to bless others, to invite people into our space over a meal, to foster relationship, to break down barriers, to demonstrate love, and to welcome those who are on the fringes of our society into fellowship. We looked that week as to how Jesus did that, and we were challenged to follow his example. In week three, we explored the importance of having an answer for those who would ask for the reason we have, why we live these questionable lives. And we saw that in that, the answer is Jesus, that we're not called to preach the gospel at people, but simply to tell them about Jesus, not to focus on their sin, but to focus on who Jesus is. And in that context, allow them to be convicted and allow God to do his work in them. And also to not focus on promoting or trying to defend the church, but merely to see the purpose that we have in Jesus as we're in relationship with him. Then last week, uh, Chris shared with us and encouraged us to be kind of like movie trailers that would highlight the best of the kingdom of God and to show off what it means to know Jesus. And to remember that we're sent ones, being sent out into the world to represent Jesus, to be his ambassadors. And in that process, we point people towards the character of God, the things that are on God's heart, things like reconciliation and justice, things like beauty and wholeness. And I guess in light of recent events that have been happening around the world, even in this last week, Uh, These kingdom characteristics are things that the church so desperately needs to be reflecting into our communities right now. So today I kind of want to gather these things together and uh, wrap it all up so that we understand where we are with all of this. So if we're truly going to be surprising the world by living these questionable and intriguing lives, by blessing others, by being hospitable, by reflecting the kingdom of God, then we really need to understand the idea of incarnational mission. Now, that's a big phrase. It's a technical phrase. And you're probably wondering what on earth that means. Let me unpack that for you. You see, we understand this idea of mission, I guess. That, but mission is about going and, and being sent, which is what Chris talked about last week that we are called by Jesus in Matthew 28, 19 and 20 to go into all the world, to make disciples of all nations, that we're to go as his representatives and to share with the world around us who he is. But we're also called to do the sorts of things that he would do in the kind of ways that he would do them. And I'll get to that a little bit more in a minute. But it's more than just going in mission. And, and being sent. It's incarnational. Now, what does that word mean? Because that's not one that we throw around in regular conversation most days. The word comes from Latin, and it simply means to make flesh. So in John's gospel, in his, his biography of Jesus, John starts with kind of a philosophical argument around uh, the pre-existence of Jesus 
as, as God. It starts, in the beginning was the Word. This is John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John then goes on to say in verse 14 that this word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's what we call the incarnation. The fact that God in Jesus became human, put on flesh and lived among us, made his dwelling among us among men. He took on all the characteristics of humanity and he made his home with us. He dwelt with us. So the idea of incarnational mission then comes from this idea of becoming one with those and dwelling among those that we're sent to be with. The, of spending time and living among those who don't know Jesus yet. Now, some people obviously are called specifically to go and do that in another place with another culture. And, uh, and you know, that's what they're called to do. Just in the same way that the evangelist is called to be the one who's bold and clear to proclaim the gospel. There are those who are called as missionaries to go into other cultures in other places to represent Jesus, to live among those people and through their questionable and intriguing lives, and their blessing of those around them create opportunities to talk about Jesus. But not everyone's called to do that. Just like we saw that not everyone's gifted as the evangelist, not everyone's called to be a missionary in a foreign culture. But we're still called to live questionable and intriguing incarnational lives where we are, to dwell among the people where we are, to be a part of our communities rather than to stand apart from them to reflect the kingdom of God in the place that we live, to know our neighbourhoods and to be known by them, to build relationship, rapport and credibility by the way we live, those questionable and intriguing lives, just as Jesus did as he became man and dwelt among us. We need to be people who bless our communities, whether that's at work, whether that's at school, whether it's in our business dealings or whether it's in our social groupings, wherever we end up being, our goal is to be intrinsically part of our community, fully invested and, and living in it, but different, just as Jesus was, a part of his community, but with different values, with different priorities, with different actions. So how do we do that? Well, two weeks ago, I mentioned Michael Frost's phrase, marinated in the gospel. That's how we do this. We need to immerse ourselves in the gospel accounts of Jesus. That if we're to live as his representatives, we need to understand his values. We need to understand his priorities. We need to understand his heart and mind. C.S. Lewis once wrote, In the same way the church exists for nothing else than to draw people into Christ, to make them little Christs. If they're not doing that, then all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. It's even doubtful, you know, whether the whole universe was created for any other purpose. It says in the Bible that the whole universe was made for Christ and that everything is to be gathered together in him. Now, don't get concerned by that little phrase, little Christs. Lewis isn't suggesting anything blasphemous here. What he's promoting is a preoccupation with the example and the teaching of Jesus for the purpose of emulating him. He's encouraging us to embrace the study of Jesus that then helps us live our lives in such a way that we get to be like him and we represent him. We become the image of Christ in our communities. But this is so much more than just that catchphrase of what would Jesus do? John Stackhouse says, what did Jesus say? That's the wrong question. 
for Christian thought. Just as what would Jesus do is the wrong question for Christian ethics. What would Jesus want me or us to think, to be and do here and now? That's the right question. You see, it's not just what Jesus would do, but rather understanding why would Jesus do that and why would he have us do that? You see, by studying the Gospels, the life of Jesus, we can understand his motivations and his reasons. We can understand the purpose behind the actions. We can figure out what Jesus would want us to do, to be, to think here and now in this situation, whatever that might look like. So regardless of what's happening in the world around us, we have an understanding of who Jesus is and what his values, his goals, his purpose, his reasoning is, so that we might then understand why we should act in particular ways and then act that way. So in order to live our questionable and intriguing lives, we need to know the teaching of Jesus and understand not just the what, but the why. We do that by spending time in the Gospels in the biographies of Jesus. These are the four accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, written by eyewitnesses to all that Jesus said and did. They tell the stories surrounding the life of Jesus. They record his teaching. They help us get alongside Jesus and learn just as his disciples did. So we need to marinate in them, as Michael Frost says to truly know them so that we can then know Jesus. So we need to prioritise the Gospels. But a word of caution in doing that. In prioritising the Gospels, let's not neglect the rest of Scripture. The Gospels are an important part, but Jesus, as part of the Godhead, authored the whole Bible, not just the Gospels. You see, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy and he says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In focusing and prioritizing on the Gospels, we need to make sure we don't neglect the rest of scripture. The Gospels need to be seen in the context of the rest of the Word of God and what God wants to say to us. John Stackhouse again says, While the story of Jesus is indeed the key to history, to emphasise the Gospels over the rest of the New Testament is to forget that Jesus is Lord over all of history. Jesus is the head of the church that succeeds him in earthly ministry. And Jesus is in fact the author of the whole New Testament via the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as he is indeed the God who inspired the whole Bible. So how do we study the Gospels? Let me give you a couple of tips of how you might do that effectively. Firstly, you need to read the Gospels. That might be pretty obvious and you might think that I didn't need to say that, but you need to read the Gospels. And in fact, you need to reread the Gospels. You need to read them through in some sort of systematic order. But you may also, and it's it's helpful to read them through in one go. So to take the Gospel of Matthew, for example, and to read it from start to finish in one sitting. So that you get the flow of that. So you get the context. You begin to see how the story of Jesus unfolds. You begin to see and pick up on the, the significant things that Matthew, for example, in his Gospel is wanting us to know. The same with Mark, Luke, and John. You begin to see the similarities between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You see the differences with where John is coming from, given that he's writing to a different audience. You begin to see the nuances and the idiosyncrasies of each of the gospel accounts as they reflect on their own eyewitness accounts of the events of Jesus' life. Now, that's a fairly big task to sit down and read a gospel in one go, but it's, it's not unattainable. The Gospel of Mark will take you roughly 90 minutes to to read. John, you can read in about two hours, and Matthew and Luke probably takes you about two and a half. 
but it's doable. So let me encourage you to do that, to take time to read the Gospels, to read them through to, and to read them over and over, to make them a regular part of your Bible reading scheme and system. The other thing is use commentaries and, and various other devotional materials as you read the Gospels. That'll help you get some of the context and some of the, the uh, background information around the setting of each of the Gospels as well. And as I say, include gospel readings in your normal reading schedule alongside the rest of Scripture. Remember, we're not prioritizing the gospels over the rest of Scripture. We're including them in that. And we need to see them in the context of what the rest of the Bible says, particularly the New Testament. So as we're reading through Paul's letters, we're also reading the gospels and we can begin to make the links and the connections between what Paul says and what Jesus says and how Paul is, is basing off the works and the teachings of Jesus as he develops and writes to the churches that he sends letters to, included as part of the whole gospel. Now, the other thing I want you to do is to read about Jesus. So read the gospels. So read the stories of Jesus in the gospels, in the scriptures, but also read other books about Jesus. See what other scholars are saying about who Jesus is to help understand the broader context of his life and his ministry, to understand the fullness of who Jesus is. So who should you read? Well, that's up to you, but a couple of places you might start. Let me give you some names. Uh, N.T. Wright is a good one to start with. Uh, Tom Wright writes a lot of things, particularly into the context around the life of where Jesus, and the, the, the place where Jesus was in his ministry. People like Tim Keller, Daryl Bock, Craig Blomberg, uh, pretty much anything by Ben Wetherington, and Ravi Zacharias are all authors that you can start with to get an understanding of where Jesus comes from and the context and the, the broader insights into his ministry and his teaching. Use them also to maybe find some other authors that they reference that will help you in your journey as well. So you need to spend time getting to know Jesus through the Gospels. You need to immerse yourself in them, to marinate in them, so that you can understand not just what would Jesus do as we live our questionable and in our intriguing lives, as we seek to bless the communities into which we are living, but to also understand the why, to truly be disciples of Jesus, those who would learn from him, not just learn about him, but learn from him, to understand his heart, to understand his desires, understand what he would have us do and how we would live our lives. As we do that, we can live those questionable and intriguing lives where we can bless others. We can be hospitable and welcome people into relationship around our table and in doing so have the opportunity to share the stories of what Jesus has done in our own lives. That Then as we're sent into our communities, as we engage day by day in all of the places, in all of the, the locations, with all of the people, within all of the relationships that we have across our communities every day, we have that opportunity to re represent and to reflect Jesus well, as those movie trailers do, as Chris encouraged us last week, to be people who represent Jesus effectively and well, because we know him. Let me encourage you this week to learn of Jesus as you begin to read and immerse yourself in the Gospels, as you begin to understand the very heart of who Jesus is and what he would have for us and how he would call us to live. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us. Thank you for the stories we have, that we have these four accounts of Jesus' life written for us, that we might understand what he did, where he went, who he related to, the things he said, the teaching that he left us, the encouragement, the hope that we have. Father, thank you that as we read the Gospels, we can be immersed into a relationship with Jesus, to know him, to truly be disciples and learners of Jesus. Father, help us not to do that in isolation from the rest of your word, that we might understand the whole word of God to us. But Father, as we immerse ourselves and marinate ourselves in the stories of Jesus, that we would then have the answers to the questions that people would ask, because the answer is Jesus, to have that opportunity to share with them about who Jesus is.
Father, as we seek to live these questionable and intriguing lives into our communities, would you help us with that? Would you strengthen and encourage us with that? And would you give us the open eyes to be attentive to that which you are doing among us and to see the opportunities to share Jesus? We ask this and pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, thanks for joining with us again today. We have appreciated your connecting in and being a part of these videos. As usual, can I ask you to click on the subscribe button below and the bell icon for so that you're notified whenever we add new videos to our channel. Um, also, as usual, in the description below will be links to the church website and to our various other sermon uh, podcasts and series that are available for you to download and to listen to. Um, also, any resources that relate to this particular uh, series will be in those descriptions below as well. Thanks again for watching. We trust you've been truly blessed as you've engaged with this material over the last few weeks, and we pray that God will continue to bless you as you live your intriguing and questionable lives wherever God has you. Bless you.